hope you're all um, getting some useful information um, out of today. Um, you don't know what you don't know, which is uh, dangerous sometimes. Um, ignorance can be bliss, but uh, you don't know what you don't know. Um, Joe Morgenberg has uh, over 30 years of experience in our industry. Uh, in 1977, Joe uh, founded um, American Aviation Services, which was acquired by NetJets by 10 years later and renamed Executive Jet Management, which is a company that some of you might have heard of. Um, Joe is a commercially ready pilot, over 4,000 hours total time. And he is our neighbor uh, at Reynolds Jet in the old uh, FISDO building across the street from Lincoln. So we know that group of people uh, at Argus very well. It's a great team, and it's uh, led by a great individual, Joe Mugenberg. Thank you. Uh, I'll get through this uh, as quickly as possible so can we, we can all go to lunch. As someone mentioned, I'm, I'm glad this isn't right before happy hour or I would be in, in big trouble. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, business aviation emerging markets. Uh, one thing that the aviation business has done over the last uh, couple decades is really shrink the, uh, the, uh, the globe. Uh, some of the big corporate flight departments, uh, some of the local ones like, like a P&G or like uh, limited stores up in Columbus, uh, flying back and forth from their home base to China is, is not any different for them to fly from Cincinnati to, to New York. Uh, so the, the, the emerging markets uh, is becoming a, 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 a big topic within the aviation industry. Through the mid to late uh, 2000s, uh, the U.S. And, and Europe dominated the Bizev marketplace in all categories. Uh, but that all changed with the start of the U.S. recession in uh, 2008 and the uh, troubles that the European uh, economies is, uh, has experienced. Uh, since then, uh, analysts and leaders in business aviation have paid increasing attention to uh, the biz aviation, biz uh, av markets uh, throughout the world. What we're going to uh, talk about today is uh, which countries and regions comprise the, this emerging markets, uh, including what's driving this growth and what factors are likely to impact trends. Uh, we will take a, a brief look at the factors, of, uh, also we'll take a brief look at the factors of fix, uh, affecting risk management, safety on a global level in business aviation. In the, uh, industry analysts often discuss uh, emerging markets from either, a, either the uh, BRIC uh, perspective that is Brazil, Russia, India, and China, uh, or uh, geographic regions such as Africa, Asia Pacific, Latin America, and the Middle East. Uh, generally speaking, global business aircraft sales and usage totals have continued to increase in recent years despite the economic setbacks in Europe and the U.S. The countries and regions that are driving the most growth are considered to be what business aviation considers emerging markets. This will just give you a little bit of breakdown of, of where airplanes are worldwide. About 34,000 business jets. So when I talk about or business aircraft, when I talk about business aircraft, I'm talking about turboprops and jets. Depending on the data source, um, either Latin America or Europe has the second highest totals in business aviation, business aircraft registrations. Uh, the totals for the two regions are very close. You, can, you will see later the pace of growth in Latin America has exceeded that of Europe in recent years. Generally speaking, the more mature uh, markets, such as North America, Europe, and Latin America, will be driving the need for replacement aircraft, where the remaining regions will continue, continue with fleet expansion uh, uh, in purchasing of new, new uh, equipment. 
Current uh, biz, they have fleet size in the BRIC companies or countries. Um, Brazil, about 820. China, 250. India, 550 or so. And Russia, about uh, 370 business aircraft. About 2,000 combined. What this, what this uh, graph shows is the growth in recent years. And what you can see here is the U.S. market, or North American market, rather, in green, it has, has not really had much of a, a growth. It's, it's remained pretty steady. Whereas at the top of the, the list, you know, uh, countries like uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean, Africa, and Asia Pacific has really, uh, has really picked up uh, substantially. The percentage of increase, uh, and this is from the Bombardier study, uh, which uh, it, it, most aircraft manufacturers uh, or most aviation service companies and OEMs uh, rely on. Uh, the increase in uh, the business jet fleet, now we're talking just about business jets, uh, from 2013 to, uh, to, to 2033, for the next 20 years, you can see a huge increase in uh, China in India, where again, North America uh, is showing slight increases. The next chart on the other side there is the uh, uh, projected uh, uh, growth as far as the uh, compound annual growth rates by countries. And it, it follows along very closely with that uh, of the, the increase in business jets. Uh, as again, uh, China and India are showing some pretty amazing growth rates. India, of course, uh, you know, has a huge population of 1.2 billion people, where China even beats that as a, a population of 1.3 billion. Uh, the Asia Pacific uh, market is, is growing at a double digit rate, or has grown at a double digit rate uh, for the past five years. Here's some, you know, some key uh, uh, countries and regions as far as their economic forecast. Again, China and India is, is where the aircraft manufacturers and the aircraft and the aviation service companies, like Argus, is focusing a lot of our, our uh, efforts. Uh, those markets are growing very, very rapidly. World GP, uh, GDP growth forecast for the next uh, few years. Uh, again, we, we we're, obviously we haven't yet recovered from the the the, uh, the big downturn was in, in 2010 2011 time frame, and we're still struggling to get back to uh, uh, to that uh, 2010 uh, G, uh, GDP uh, that we were all enjoying before the. A big recession hit. The worldwide economy took a, uh, about a year, was about a year behind the U.S. economy as far as the uh, 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 impact of the recession. Billionaires. <laughs> Another metric uh, that is favored by the uh, aviation marketplace uh, is the global billionaire count. Uh, the percentage of increase in billionaires in emerging markets is, is positively correlated with the growth in business to aircraft ownership. I, uh, I spend a lot of time in, uh, in China with, uh, with my company, and uh, the, the growth in business aviation in China that is directly related to the growth in billionaires is, uh, is pretty amazing. This uh, chart is, is represents, you know, the darker blue circles represents the, the current count of business jets uh, by global region, region in 2013. The outer ring, lighter ring, uh, shows the anticipated growth. Uh, again, you can see that North America, uh, you know, currently uh, has about uh, 98 or 9,800 airplanes or so. By 2033, we're looking at about uh, 
15,000. Uh, as far as, again, China and uh, India are, are showing some amazing growth in, uh, in business aviation. There's two driving forces behind the growth in business aviation worldwide. One is, is uh, the GDP trends, obviously. But number two is the removal of, removal of barriers, such as infrastructure and regulatory lim limitations, which means you know poor aircraft conditions, uh, not enough airports, strict civil uh, airspace limitations, et cetera. But the, the, and we're gonna talk about this in a few minutes here, but when we look at some of the emerging markets like China and India, uh, the, the problem with infrastructure is, is really their biggest limiting factor. This is a quote from uh, a Booz Allenton uh, uh, Hamilton study. Uh, again, the, the emerging markets, uh, you know, the, the biggest impact of their growth is the fact that they are having a, a, a problem with their infrastructure, uh, again, pri primarily uh, China and, and India. Uh, uh, the regulatory framework has not kept pace with the growth uh, of business aviation, the lack of defined set of national policies, often overlapping roles and responsibilities across various aviation-related entities, such as regulators, airlines, airports, and municipalities. Uh, lack of transparent uh, and effective governance uh, has limited uh, the management of airspace and air service uh, agreements across different countries. A uh, wide range of uh, operational uh, 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 obstacles uh, that exist globally. Uh, all uh, operators in all global regions want improvements in regulatory issues, such as uh, duty time cycles, the day of uh, time of day use regulations. Uh, restrictions, air traffic modernization, and user fee and tax laws. So I just want to spend just a few minutes on, again, uh, some of these emerging markets and, and some of the positive trends and also the, the, the challenges. In China, they're currently building um, about 100 airports. I think in the U.S., I think the last airport that was built uh, was Denver uh, back in 1994. So 20 years ago was the last airport that was built in the U.S. Uh, in 2013, China brought on 10 new regional airports and gave approval for uh, 100 and almost 170 general aviation firms. Uh, passenger traffic is increasing roughly 10% uh, in 2012 and 2013. Uh, some improvements in, in regulatory requirements, uh, such as a reduction in uh, time it takes to file a flight plan. It used to be four days to, to uh, file a flight plan in China. Uh, now it's about four hours, so it's a huge improvement. Uh, the China aviation industry, uh, general aviation uh, company, uh, is, is getting close to finalizing uh, design for a new turboprop, uh, uh, which is by the way, being powered by uh, the new GE engine. Um, and they're working on a couple biz jets. Uh, in addition, uh, Cessna uh, will soon be building the caravan in, uh, in uh, uh, China. Uh, China also owns uh, Cirrus uh, and Continental Motors. So what they did there is they actually built an airport in uh, Shunhai that uh, specifically for uh, aircraft manufacturing. So before they had even a even their first aircraft manufacturer, they went ahead and built basically a, a Wichita uh, so they can start building their own airplanes. Uh, they've announced recently set up, setting up a $3.2 billion fund uh, for uh, aviation investment, and they have uh, 62 Chinese cities that have set up uh, what they're calling aviation economic zones for aircraft manufacturers. The, uh, 
the big challenges. Uh, the airspace is controlled by the, uh, by the military. Uh, any non-military activity has a much lower priority. Uh, low, uh, low altitude airspace uh, is a, is a, access is a problem. Uh, not many FBOs. Uh, filing flight plans for non-Chinese aircraft is, is a long, expensive process. And fl uh, flight route availability uh, limits uh, jets to fly at uh, uh, much lower altitudes, which of course are, is very fuel efficient. They have a serious problem with uh, skilled pilots and, and, and maintenance technicians. Uh, what happens there is, is when a pilot gets to be, gets up to about 3,500 hours of total time, they almost automatically uh, go to the air carriers. So then the whole process starts all over again. Uh, one of the things that, that my company does, Argus does, is we do a lot of safety audits, and we've audited a lot of uh, Chinese operators. And the, the pilot qualifications and the pilot, not only total time, but time and type, is, uh, is, a, uh, is a serious problem in China. Uh, they're anticipating in the next uh, 20 years needing about 80,000, or about 70,000 new pilots and about 100,000 mechanics. Uh, so they've got, got some huge issues in front of them. Uh, besides low time pilots, there's some, there's some serious cultural issue, issues. For instance, if, when US companies want to fly to China on, let's say, commercially, and then they want to charter an airplane once they get there to fly around the country, our customers, some of these Fortune 500 companies that were, were using these charter airplanes would, would show up at the airport and there would, not have, there would not be an airplane available simply because one of their other customers would call and schedule that airplane and uh, the charter was just, just canceled for the, for the U.S. customers. Uh, there's no uh, aircraft hangars, uh, so all the airplanes are sitting outside which uh, is a huge problem because of the, the air pollution. So now we're seeing these Gulf Streams and Challengers and Falcons. By the way, the, the Chinese, they only buy new, new airplanes. They don't buy pre-owned. So they're buying all these new airplanes and are sitting outside. And uh, because the pollution is so bad, they're having serious problems with corrosion. Uh, in order to fly within China, uh, because the military controls the airspace and the, the airports, uh, the crew must be Chinese. So there's a lot of expat, expats that are, are working in China as pilots, but they can't fly those uh, inter-Chinese routes because uh, they're required to be Chinese citizens. The other thing that was amazing to us is when we first started doing work in China is how filthy the airplanes were inside. They, they never cleaned the airplanes. So you would have a brand new Gulfstream, you know, G550, uh, and it would be absolutely filthy. They didn't really were, were not up to Western standards. India, uh, you know, growing wealth. When you, when we looked at the the billionaires before, the growing wealth is making business, business aircraft ownership uh, more positive. Uh, and the need for uh, you know business leaders to access remote locations is is very important. However, they've got some serious issues. Uh, for instance, uh, in late 2012, Indian's uh, civil aviation minister, and this is like our FAA uh, administer, uh, minister, uh, he required uh, that he personally give approval for every aircraft acquisition. Uh, needless to say, that uh, uh, that slowed down the process quite a bit. Uh, in 2009, 25% uh, uh, import duty was placed on business aircraft purchases. Uh, prior to that, it was growing at an average of about 12.5% uh, a year. Now it's slowed to about 10% a year because of the uh, uh, import duties. Uh, their currency has been very weak, so it makes uh, make it harder for companies to uh, able to afford jets, jet fuel. Uh, India also has a serious uh, uh, pilot issue. Uh, 
in order to, to uh, get a pilot's license in, or, to, or if you have a license to get a job flying a, 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 uh, for a corporate operator or for an airline for that matter, you really have to be politically connected. So unless you have those political connections, you're not going to get a, a flying job. Also, very, very poor training. I don't know if you've, if you've uh, seen any of the uh, uh, news articles over the last year or so where there's been a number of airline pilots that were uh, that they discovered actually didn't even have pilot's license. So sort of scary. Russia, uh, positive trends. Uh, Bizav growth continues to uh, continues despite slowing economic and operational restrictions. Uh, the government has reduced taxes and streamlined some of the regulations uh, that affect uh, business aviation. Uh, business aviation continues to grow at about a 10% rate. And the 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 cost of chartering an airplane uh, in in Russia uh, is considerably less than than. Europe for that Europe or the U.S. for that matter. So, in many cases, just a few uh, first-class airline tickets uh, is less expensive than, uh, or is more expensive than than uh, chartering a jet. Uh, the challenges, uh, in order to avoid high import fees, the majority of Russian-owned aircraft are based in uh, in Europe, or registered in Europe. Uh, ground service, uh, very expensive very high fees, and the charter activity now in, in uh, Russia is down considerably uh, since the economic sanctions have been uh, imposed by the, by the EU. The Middle East, uh, Saudi Arabia started to invest up, upwards of uh, 54 billion in their aviation transportation industry. Uh, Saudi Arabia is also home to about 20% of the business aircraft registered in the Middle East, making them a dominant player in the region. Uh, the UAE has 17% of the business aircraft uh, uh, based there. Uh, and, uh, and like Saudi Arabia, they increased their uh, business aircraft, uh, aircraft totals threefold in recent years. Overall, uh, the business aircraft marketplace in the Middle East has doubled in the past five years and expect to double again over the course of the next five years. I think the, the challenges are, are pretty obvious. Uh, the political unrest uh, is uh, an occasional landing and airspace restrictions have, have, have brought about some uh, huge concerns. And the shortage of skilled workers, training centers, MROs, and FBOs. One of the things that, that keeps the the aircraft manufacturers, or for that matter, the entire aviation industry awake at night, is the the unrest there in the Middle East. And the reason I'm saying that is, you know, currently uh, fuel is the aircraft operator's number one expense. The average for a, a gallon of, of Jet A today is uh, about six dollars and twenty-five cents per gallon. Uh, the current uh, cost uh, or rate for a, a barrel of oil is, is $95. With the, with the unrest that's going on in the Middle East right now, any interruption in that, uh, in that flow of oil and therefore jet fuel would have a major impact on business aviation where we could see the, the cost of jet fuel going from the current $6.25 a gallon to $10 or $11 a gallon uh, in the U.S., there's an interruption in, in uh, that uh, flow of oil. So, what's going on in the Middle East right now is having a, a huge uh, is a huge concern to the, the entire aviation industry. Okay, um, Africa, uh, lots of inefficiency uh, in, in commercial aviation uh, in, that that has helped boost. Uh, business aviation. For instance, uh, there's no east to west routes in Africa. So if, if you want to go from South Africa to, let's say, Nigeria, you have to go from South Africa 
to Dubai, or in some cases even Paris, and then back to Nigeria. So there's no east-west uh, uh, commercial aviation or commercial uh, airlines available. Uh, uh, you know, efforts are, are being undertaken to improve uh, uh, cost of ownership and local registration that will bring more revenue uh, uh, from taxes and support service. Uh, currently, uh, a, disport, uh, a disproportionate number of biz business jets are, are locally owned or registered outside uh, Africa. Uh, local growth centers are evolving, uh, some of the leaders, South Africa, Nigeria, and Morocco. Uh, challenges, uh, very, very poor infrastructure. Uh, the growth is more tied toward, towards the turboprops models than biz jets uh, due to the con condition of the airstrips and facilities that are not prepared for, for biz jets. Interesting enough, uh, interestingly, uh, uh, Pilatus is, is building a, a, uh, a light jet right now uh, that is specifically for the, the African market. It's, uh, it's a jet that will be able to land on, on and take off on unimproved strips and, and airfields. Uh, lack of cooperation between civil aviation authorities uh, or agencies. In other words, if you're in Tanzania and you want to fly from Tanzania to, to Kenya, which are right next to each other, uh, you can't do that. You have to go from Tanzania to some other country, Ethiopia or or maybe Nigeria, uh, and then to, to Kenya because the two countries aren't, aren't uh, getting along and not talking to one another. Uh, so there's uh, significant uh, cultural differences between various, various nat nations. Um, the perception outside Africa is a very poor safety record. Uh, in reality, there's only really two or three countries that contribute to that high accident rate. The number the, the number one company or country for uh, aviation accidents in in, uh, uh, in Africa is Nigeria. I think uh, they have the record. I think the last the top the last ten aircraft accidents, uh, six of them were in Nigeria. So there's there's needless to say a lot of challenges. Okay, Latin America. Uh, Significant growth in Latin, Latin America. Uh, this is primarily for replacement aircraft, and, and it's, it's a, you know, it is an emerging market as far as new equipment is concerned as well. Uh, the growth in the number of billionaires in, in South America and, and the growth in corporate profits is, is, is helping, a, uh, helping business aviation in that marketplace. Uh, Brazil leads uh, business aviation growth. Uh, with uh, 623 business jets, a lot of very wealthy people there. They've also got 16, uh, 1,600 helicopters uh, based there. Uh, Brazil and, and primarily Sao Paulo is probably the biggest helicopter market, uh, uh, helicopter market uh, globally uh, for a lot of reasons, but primary reason is it's, it's impossible. I don't know if any of you have ever been to Sao Paulo, but I've been there a few times. Absolutely impossible to drive there. So uh, the, 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 the helicopters are truly uh, air taxis in, in Sao Paulo. Uh, the, the challenges, you know, uh, economic problems. You know, they, uh, you know, demand for Latin American products and services uh, are being impacted because of a lot of economic problems and primarily inflation. Uh, insignificant, uh, insufficient uh, access to airports. Uh, you know, Brazil is the size of the U.S., but there's only 130 airports uh, with scheduled airline service. Um, they're attempting to, to build more airports, uh, but it's a very, very slow process. We were at uh, we were at the uh, uh, the business uh, aviation convention in uh, in Sao Paulo uh, a few weeks ago, and uh, uh, what was interesting was that there was more helicopters on display at the uh, air show than there were aircraft, uh, fixed wing aircraft. 
Okay. The, the future success of global business uh, aviation growth is also dependent on continued advancements in safety. Uh, IBAC, uh, the International Business Aircraft Council, was found, uh, founded in 1981 and has, a, has had a huge influence on, uh, on uh, safety worldwide. They, they built a standard, uh, the uh, ISBEO standard, which stands for International Standard for Business Aviation Ops. And they've also done a lot of accidents, uh, aircraft accidents uh, analysis to identify uh, uh, what, are, what the needs are to mitigate this risk. Uh, some of those include uh, safety management systems, uh, flight data analysis, uh, adherence to operational manuals and aircraft flight manuals, improved runway conditions and reporting, uh, uh, highest proportion of global business aviation accidents occur in the landing phase, and this is something that IBAC is, is spending a lot of time on uh, uh, studying. Uh, you know, operational improvements, you know, accelerate the uh, implementation of vertical guidance approaches, and try to ease the, uh, the travel between regions uh, where, uh, you know, there's Lots of they're working on lots of improvements and regulations and infrastructure to to help it uh, uh, travel between these global regions uh, uh, easier for business aircraft operators. Okay, the, the, going forward, um, which markets, uh, uh, which emerging markets will dominate in the next ten years and beyond will depend on the multiple factors included in each region or country ability to to keep stable or grow. Wealth creation is number one. Uh, global trade options. Uh, restrictions inhibiting regulations and improving infrastructure uh, needs to be uh, uh, dealt with. Uh, and of course, the, the continued improvement in safety. Uh, many factors uh, you know, point towards an optimistic growth path for business aviation globally, uh, however, uh, uncertainty uh, will remain in relation to political and economic situations that affect the business aviation marketplace. As we, uh, as I travel around the world and the people within my company uh, uh, travel extensively, uh, we're finding that the, the, our business is about 60% of our revenues now come from outside the U.S. And as we're, we're seeing that this global marketplace is becoming such a huge factor uh, within the, the overall uh, business aviation uh, industry. That's it. Does anybody have any, uh, any questions? That's a that's a really good question. You know, it used to be that you know when airplanes uh, old you know airplanes aged here in the U.S. they all went sort of south of the border, but that's not ha or to Africa, and that's not really happening anymore. Uh, you know, in in China, the, it, culturally, they don't they won't buy uh, anything that's pre-owned. It's just not in their culture. They they want a, something brand new. They don't want something that was used by someone else. So. Not only do I not, I don't know where those airplanes are going to go. I don't know what's going to happen with all the airplanes that are using China, for example, all the airplanes that are in China, because I'd be very hesitant to to purchase or bring an airplane back from one of these countries back into the U.S. Uh, you know, the maintenance issue, again, corrosion issues. Uh, they just haven't quite got to the the level that the U.S. has as far as how do you maintain and take care of corporate airplanes. It's a real issue. You know, we have, uh, 
I have yet to see a pre-owned airplane go into China. I know NetJets has a, has a couple uh, 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 hawkers that they're they're now operating in China that are that are uh, you know not brand new airplanes. It's going to be interesting to see if how those airplanes are accepted. It's just a very odd culture. Yeah. Anything else? I know you're all hungry. Well, thank you. All right. Um, I designed this uh, with uh, time in mind. Uh, so I want to get started back again at uh, half past the hour. So 45 minutes. You can uh, bring your food in here. Um, just be very conscious of uh, the fact that this is a great facility. So, but you're welcome to bring your food in here anywhere else. Now, uh, for those that are really hungry, uh, go out the back door because the food is upstairs. If you're not so hungry, you can go out the front door and up the wooden steps. But all the food is on that second floor up here. So uh, we'll see you back here at half past the hour. Thank you. Thank you.